start with, I'm going to introduce the first of our gang of four, Leslie Whittaker, who at the time, back in 1973, 72, was a solicitor with her own uh, um, practice in Coventry. And, um, and she is actually rather well known in Green Party circles for having purchased the notorious magazine, <laughs> uh, Playboy magazine, in the summer of 72. Um, because, of course, there was an excellent article on population growth by Paul Ehrlich. And uh, that uh, particular magazine became very uh, influential, shall we say, with the founders. And uh, anyway, then, uh, Leslie became the first national secretary of the party and went on to author the party's first ever manifesto, the Manifesto for Survival. So, Leslie, over to you. Oh, that Playboy magazine. How I wish I hadn't been in Smith's. No, I don't, because it really was terrifically influential. And the big thing about it was that this well-known international academic who was an expert on population issues said in that interview, which was a serious interview, for those of you who are not familiar with Playboy magazine, it tries to attain legitimacy by having a major interview from time to time, which is absolutely serious, and that's what this was. And Paul Ehrlich was saying that he thought this issue was so serious that he and his wife were going to dedicate two years of their lives doing nothing else but promoting the issues of population and the impact this would have on the world. And the concept of giving two years was something that did sink in. Not only the issue that we were facing with regard to population growth, which of course featured in the Club of Rome's work, and indeed everybody else that was talking about anything, but we decided that something had got to be done. And along with some other contacts that we had at the famous Napton Bridge Inn in the middle of Warwickshire, um, we started knocking, as you do in a pub, <laughs> the world to rights. And one of us would pick up one issue and another would pick up another. And in the end, we decided that we would come together and try and work out what was going wrong, why it had gone wrong, what could be done to put it right. And so everyone went away and took a topic and thought about it and came back with information. And we all said, well, it, it's there, it's going wrong, but nobody's doing anything about it except in their own little pit. And I use the expression because at this time, dear Edward de Bono, who has gone on since to teach a lot of people how to think and to be more familiar with their own brains, had started this concept that people were working in silos and they were isolated from each other. And if this sounds familiar, it's the way people have been educated for the last 40 years or more. And nobody was actually floating over the top, picking up what was going on and putting it together. And we could relate to that. And we wanted very much to set about being a holistic organization. So we were going to have another pressure group. And then we thought, actually, it's no good doing any of that unless you can make decisions and make something happen. How do you do that? You have to be in a position to take decisions. Where do they take decisions? Parliament. Oh, we're going to have to start a political party. How do you do that? Well, Tony and I were lawyers. We had a huge library. So the first thing was, what is the legal entity that is a political party? And I spent some hours trying to find out, and the answer is there is no such thing. So that set us about thinking that if there wasn't such a thing, we could invent it. So we invented not just the Green Party, but as we saw it, our own party. Because as David said, it was a different world. And for those of you who are old enough to remember, it might revive a few memories. For those of you who are not, you will be incredulous. There was no internet. There were no mobile telephones. It was a couple of years before even the ones that were the size of a brick and fitted into a car were invented. Typing was the way that you did things, and that involved a piece of paper on which somebody hammered keys and put a piece of carbon paper underneath, and you got a copy. And if you were a really good typist, you could do two carbons. And by the time you got to the second, it wasn't worth trying to photocopy. Oh, there's a the thing, photocopiers. 
They hardly existed either. Everything had to be Romeoed, done with sheets of paper and, and messy chemicals. You cannot believe what it was like to try and communicate if you weren't there. And if you were, you'd rather forget. <laughs> Cut and paste is an expression you're all familiar with now if you play with your computer. Well, I have to tell you that when this manifesto was brought out, yes, it's true, I did draft it. Um, I sat in my office because Teddy had gone away to draft it, gone away to Italy. There was a postal strike. Then there was a train strike. Teddy thought he wouldn't bother to come back. He couldn't get his draft to us by post. And there was a conference organized, much like this one. And, well, it wasn't as big. There we were, no, no manifesto. So I sat down, having traveled around the country with Michael and Frieda and Tony, we had spoken to so many people and got so many ideas as to what they wanted done that it was really quite easy to sit down and write it under the headings that were basically those of the Club of Rome. And my poor secretary, highly qualified legal secretary, sat there saying, well, what is this word ecology? How do you spell sustainable? And she, because she didn't want to retype a page, because if you made a mistake, you had to start again. And so she, bless her, spent days trying to get out the first copy that went out to everyone. And of course, they all got their drafts. They were all invited to propose amendments. This sounds familiar, I know. And they did. And they came back to us. And they were pieces of paper. And so we had more pieces of paper, literally cut with scissors, the strips from all the various branches. And at that stage, we had 40. It wasn't bad, really, from start to first conference. 40 branches that went from Cornwall to Caithness. We were quite proud of ourselves. And they all had something to say about it. <laughs> and somehow we'd got just about everything wrong. So then we had to try and, and borrow a friend's Xerox, which a magical thing. This, this created copies that lasted more than a week and didn't involve chemicals. And then we sent those out to the branches, and they came to the conference, and they voted in everything, and <coughs> none of it fitted together because it was all in different styles. So our glorious manifesto for survival reads amazingly well. And if you go and look at the copy that's on the board in the corridor, I think you'll be surprised at how something that came from nowhere actually does hang together. And it hangs together because the issues that it dealt with are sadly still relevant today. And it seems just about as appropriate to put that out now as it did then. And looking back over 40 years, one of the sad things, I think, is that, yes, in, in one way, we've affected the way everybody in the world lives. It, it's true to say we have done that. And it's hard to see where it came from. But it came from Coventry, which was a place much affected by industrial problems at the time. And interestingly, in those early days, when we spoke to people who lived in agricultural rural areas, they couldn't see what we were talking about, except in the glories of East Anglia. And that's where Teddy went to campaign in the first election, February 74, with a camel that he borrowed from his friend John Aspinall, who had a zoo. <laughs> because, as he said, as he led the camel round campaigning, uh, you know, this is an idea I take back to the branches, <laughs> suggest it. Um, it. The way you're farming now, this is going to be a desert. Get used to the camel. <laughs> Has anything changed? It's strange. I started off worrying about the world when I was about eight. I kept on worrying about the world through smog, fog that was literally so thick that if you were trying to drive along in a car, I as a child was put on the bonnet of the car and had to wave right and left to indicate to my father which way he should steer. Most of you will never have experienced anything like that, or indeed the green snow of London in the early 1960s, and the bronchitis that went with it. The world has changed. Thank goodness. And I thought stone was black. I came from a coal mining area in Lancashire. 
the middle of Manchester, there was heavy industry everywhere, and the acid ate into the stone, and the stone turned black. Then I went to London, and London was black. So obviously everything that grew out of the ground and was chipped out and was black. And suddenly, the Clean Air Act came in, and slowly buildings got cleaned, and there they were, cream and white and grey and brown, and stone was magical stuff. And I thought, golly, it's amazing what you can do. We campaigned standing on the steps of South Africa House. Some of you will probably have done that. <laughs> and that was where the social aspects all came in. I came from an industrial area with slums and poverty. And we knew things weren't right there either. And so the whole thing came together to a meeting where we invited our friends, Michael and Frieda, to come along. They came and joined us and said, you're right. It's no good. Everybody's talking about all this, but something's got to be done. And the people that we had around us at that time disappeared, except for Michael and Frieda and Tony and I, because talking about setting up a political party was far too radical for most of them. And sadly, I think that's still a case today, but there we are, we're working on it, and you have taken things forward, which is another thing about the different world then, Blessings upon NASA, because that image that got printed on the front page of every newspaper around the world in December 69, actually it was 68, wasn't it? Earthrise. It was something that touched everybody who saw it. And suddenly the concept of spaceship Earth, something floating in space, completely on its own, with no help except what it had got on board, hit people. And that opened the door to us. And if you haven't seen it for a while, try and find a copy and have another look. Because that was a really pivotal moment in the history of the human race. And it changed the attitude of everyone to the sort of work that we had to do. I still find it moving now when I sit and look at it, whether it's one of the sapphire and emerald versions or the cloud swirled ones, or they're always beautiful. And the need to preserve that planet was something that really hit home and that we went out talking to people in the streets and they said, particularly in the 74 election, um, marvelous ideas, fantastic. Why is nobody doing anything about this? And we said, well, we are. We're standing for Parliament. We set off thinking that we'd really like to put a candidate in every constituency. But unfortunately, we didn't have time to do that. If you do it now, you could manage it. With all the social media, the internet, and everything else, it could be done. But because of the way that the world was disintegrating, with dear Mr Heath, um, the election came too soon. But we did manage to put candidates in the field. And there are one or two here tonight who were standing in that particular election. I was told in the streets, brilliant idea. They'll never allow you to have your name on the ballot paper. They were nearly right. It felt that way. Mm. Especially because we had got this party called People. We took the view people were the cause of the problem, substantially. People were the reason to try and solve it. People were the means to try and solve it. We didn't want to be stuck on the left-right spectrum of usual politics in those days. And there were only about five political parties. Labour, Conservative, Liberal. They hadn't met the Democrats at that stage. <laughs> national, British National Party, National Front, and the Communists. So. Even the monster raving loony party hadn't quite got into gear. And there we were on the ballot paper, and people did vote for us. In fact, I, I came third. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> the good thing about that was that it started people looking, and the newspapers started to come, and Woman's Hour came, and so did various other things. And to those of you who think that Playboy was a dreadful thing to have as one of the initial influences, 
because that's not a feminist view. I have to say, I was a solicitor in the days when half the profession was not female. Yeah. I banged my head against every wall and every door, and when people spoke to me on the phone, they'd say, oh, can I please speak to somebody in authority? I said, I'm a partner in the firm. How high do you want to go? <laughs> and I'm pleased to say that these days, the profession's equally split, and that's marvellous, and we want to keep going with that. Unfortunately, the issues of poverty and inequality remain. The international problems remain. And all I would say to you is, thank you so much for doing what we wanted at the time. That Apollo image of the rocket taking off stuck with us all. And we said, we'll be the first stage. We'll fall away. The next stage can take over. The next stage can take over. Some of you are still the first stage because Clive's still here. <laughs> Some of you will be a sixth or seventh stage, no doubt, carrying on with the work, which is very humbling. I've been walking around talking to a lot of you today, and to hear the passion and the enthusiasm that still goes on, all I can say is keep it up and make the next two years count. Go for simple messages. Go for the next election. Stay away from all the fiddling that goes around politics these days and make a fight of it in two years time and who knows where you might get to thank you for all your continuing hard work best of luck for the next 40 years